that class? Uh, you'll have to assign it to the class because uh, see, as far as it's the material is concerned, you've created a material, right? Now you may call it a pump, but SAP doesn't know it's a pump, right? So you'll have to assign it. You'll have to assign it to whatever classes you think it may belong to. There's no automated mechanism. So the process of classification, right? The broad process of classification goes at least the way SAP describes it like this. First, you create all kinds of characteristics that you're interested in. Okay, so here we are saying these are all the master list of characteristics that I can think of: power, thread type, length, gloss, weight, etc., etc. Many characteristics, and of course, for each characteristic, you will specify what type of characteristic it is. You know, what type of value does it accept? Does it accept? Alphabetic values, numeric values, alphanumeric values, Boolean values, etc. Okay, so you'll specify all of that and then you collect these characteristics together into classes. Okay, so you collect the characteristics together and form all kinds of classes. We're just seeing an example of one class called paint, which we used in this example, but there could be lots of classes that you create. Okay. Uh, so that I think the reason they say you first create the characteristics and then create the classes is uh, the same characteristic may be applicable in multiple classes. So we shouldn't want to duplicate it. Okay, so that's what it is. So you create the characteristics, create the classes, and then you do two things. You assign an object to a class that is called assignment, right? Just like we did in the previous slide here. We assign material X to the class paint. This is called assignment. But just assigning the material to the class paint is not enough. Because we are saying paint has two attributes or two characteristics called color and gloss. Now that it has two characteristics called color and gloss, I have to say what is the color and gloss for this material. Because I have assigned it, now I have to give values to those properties. right? That process is what is called uh, value assignment okay so the process is create characteristics um, create classes assign objects to classes and then assign values to the corresponding characteristics that is value assignment okay once you have done that you can do searching like we saw in the previous slide okay so this is the broad process of classification so create characteristics and allowed values, maintain allowed values is I said, right? What kind of values it can take, maintain classes and assign characteristics to classes, create an object and assign the class. After that, the object will be findable. Okay, so that's the broad idea of classification in SAP. So the two important processes are assignment in which you assign an object to a class, value assignment in which you then assign the values to the characteristics. Okay. <clears throat> so this thing you can do in the object, right? So you can do once you have assigned the object to the class or in fact even the assignment of the object to the class itself, you can do either from the object side or you can do it from within the classification system. Right? It can be done from both sides. Just in terms of the mechanics of how you do all of these tasks. It's possible from either side. That's another topic done. Right? As, like I said, this is a grab bag of different topics. So first we looked at the document management system. Then we looked at the PLM interface. Then we looked at classification. And now we are looking at another question that you were talking about earlier. Right, your pizza is here. <laughs> okay, so here what we are talking about is several products like these, right, have many different variants. Right, so you can order a pizza and you can select all kinds of things. You can select the toppings, you can probably select the type of cheese, you can select the type of base you want, etc. Or any of these products, if say buying a car, of course, we select all kinds of features. Right? Unless you're like me, who just goes into a dealership and says, give me that and walk away. Okay. <laughs> so we select all sorts of features, right? So these are called 
there are lots of variants for these kinds of products. Okay, now the the point that comes up in this kind of a scenario is, okay, I've got that the car, and I can offer the car in so many different variations. You know, sunroof or not, and then leather seats or not, and uh, seat heaters or all kinds of things. Okay, now. Do you maintain a different bomb for each kind of variation? Yeah. That's difficult because you have hundreds of thousands of variations, literally. You can't maintain a bomb for each one separately. Okay, so that's the main point, right? So the main problem is some products have many variants, which are combinations of features. Keeping separate, uh, you know, materials, the uh, bills of material for each is cumbersome. And in fact, Keeping separate material codes for each variant is also a pain. You don't want to keep a separate material code for each of the thousand variations. So you'll keep one material code, right? So th that's the whole idea here. And the solution is what SAP calls as a configurable material, right? They call it as a configurable material, okay? So you'll have this material, but it's configurable. So that's the idea here. So configurable material will represent the superset of all the available features, right? So if you took that car, it will have a superset of all the allowed possible variations. So the car will have leather seats and cloth seats, okay? All possible combinations, okay? Therefore, it's not really a finished product by itself. It has to be configured, then it will become a real finished product. Okay, but by itself, it's just uh, a superset. It's got the potential to become any of those 1000 things. Okay, and obviously, the actual bill of material and routing to make each of those would be different. Right, so that's, that's the whole point. So you'll get the finished product only after you configure it. Okay, so this is what is called a variant product, configurable product. So here, for example, is a pump, which is a config configurable product. So it has all these things. Pump type can be one of these three. Mode can be one of these two. Uh, lift can vary from two to twenty meters, etc., etc., etc. Right. So all of these things they represent the different alternatives for each of those points. Okay. So this pump clearly can be, you know, it's it's not really a pump the way it is defined yet. You have to select one value from each of these and then it can be a pump. In fact, not all combinations of values may even be feasible, right? You, you may not be able to, some of the combinations may not work. Okay. Uh, <coughs> what, what is that? No, I was just saying about uh, the property based compatible rules, that's what you apply. And then you do that. Okay, so this is the idea of, a, you know, variant configuration, a configurable product, right? This is called a configurable material. And like I've already said, you don't have to create separate material for each of the possible configurations. But instead, what you'll have is what is called as a super bomb and a super routing. Okay, so take this example here. Uh, this is the super bomb. This is the super task list or routing. Okay. Now remember in super bomb you see there are several products. But here maybe these are different options. Maybe here these are different options. Okay. That's the thing. But once you have configured it, you will have a real bomb. Okay. Notice that there are no options at each of those stages. They have the, you had options, but here it's fixed into something. Okay. So this is what you refer to as a dynamic bomb or an order bomb which makes sense, right? Because when somebody places an order, they say, I want feature A, feature B, feature C. So for that order, you created a bomb. It's a dynamic bomb, okay? That's what it is. And correspondingly, based on the uh, features selected, you might select, uh, you might generate a routing or a task list, which is a dynamic operation sequence for this chosen characteristics, okay? So that's what they call. So you've got the master data, you apply the various dependencies, right? That is, you say, uh, for, uh, you know, for size, I want 15 meters. 
or for uh, whatever. I want an electric pump as opposed to uh, some other kind of pump and so on. So once you select all of those, those dependencies that you select will then result in us getting configured bombs and configured routings. Okay, so this is the concept of a configurable material. And why are we studying it in this chapter? Because SAP internally uses the classification system to achieve all of this. Okay, so somehow in the background, the classification system is what is you, what SAP uses to do this. Okay, so that's why this is being talked about right here. Okay, we have seen all this. All the materials to produce a variant are here in super bomb. All the operations are here to produce any of the variants. But once you have configured it, you then get a real bomb and a real uh, routing. <clears throat> okay, and dependency is nothing but assigning the characteristic values to select the needed features. Okay, so here is an example of a configurable pump. And... Uh, you know, this is the general product, right? So you could have bearing A, B, C. These are our various options, K, C, etc. So you know, this is just uh, another way of stating that the same earlier diagram, really. Okay. So what you're seeing here is a super bomb. Okay. So that's about configurable materials. Okay. So now we are moving on to a different aspect which is uh, you know product structure management and uh, the sap has this tool called as a product structure browser okay it's really a tree display of all the objects belonging to each other functionally okay and the specific context that we are looking at here is uh, you're looking at for example the bill of materials classifications for a particular material anything connected to a material Okay, you've got all the documents connected with it, any equipments, it's a change numbers to that material, etc. Okay, so everything connected with that is being shown in one place. That is what they call as a product structure browser. Right? And as we've already seen, bombs, classes, documents, characteristics, routings, everything is being shown in one single screen. Right? So from within the browser, you have all these capabilities. You can call and change objects from within the browser, right? you can limit the detail that is shown through all kinds of filters and then enterprise application integrated viewer, EAI viewer enables seeing originals from within the browser which is connecting to the document system really. Okay, So from within the browser you can go and see any original documents that are also connected with this. Okay, So that's just one more thing on the side, the product structure browser which helps in managing the life cycle of a product. Okay, another tool called as the engineering workbench. Okay, it's a tool that is uh, useful to maintain uh, engineering related, related specifications and so on. Okay, and for example here you're seeing that a particular person uh, in the engineering workbench you can create what are called work lists and from the work list, you can operate on multiple objects simultaneously, right? So in this case, we are working on a, a routing and a bomb. It's a powerful tool for maintaining bomb and routing together. And not just a tool for uh, creating a bomb and routing, but also editing and modifying bombs and routings. Okay, now there's one important thing that this tool allows, which is not normally possible. Uh, let's say you're editing a bill of material, right? There is a bill of material object. You have got the bill of material open on your SAP uh, GUI, right? At that point, you have a lock on that object. On the whole bomb, you have locked it. Now, somebody else tries to work on any part of the bomb, they won't be able to because it's locked. Okay? What this allows is selective locking. Right? So you can place a lock on a subcomponent of the bill of material and allow other people to work on other components that you have not locked. Okay, That's the uh, one important aspect of the engineering work workbench. Selective locking it allows. Okay, So within this, you uh, work list is nothing but 
you know, a list of things that you want to work on, which is what allows selective locking in the first place. You say, I, I intend to work on these, these, these objects. So you're into giving the system information that you're going to work specifically on these subcomponents so that it can then go and lock those subcomponents alone. Whereas when you just open a bomb for editing on your GUI, the system cannot predict what you're going to work on. So it has to lock the entire object. Okay, so that's the idea of the engineering workbench. It allows simultaneous processing that I just spoke about earlier. Okay, and as I said earlier, entire routings and bomb don't have to be locked, right? Because through your work list, you have said, these are the specific things I'm going to work on. Okay, so different individual items can be concurrently processed by different users. So in this diagram, you're seeing two different users. Okay, this user is working on uh, this part of the routing and working on this part of the bomb. Simultaneously, another user is working on different parts of the bomb, of the same bomb, in the same routing. So it allows for concurrent processing. Okay, so in addition, it also gives you, if somebody, if you try to access the object and it says it's locked, it gives you, or access, let's say, a routing, uh, a particular operation in a routing and it happens to be locked, the system gives you information as to who is having that lock at that point. Right, so that you can then try to get it released, talk to them or whatever it is. It gives you contact information. Okay. Uh, now we move on to another aspect. Like I said, this is just a grab bag. Here we are looking at uh, consequences of a material change. Right, when a material changes, there can be lots of consequences within the system. Right, because material is so central, you may make some changes to the material and from an engineering point of view, it could have a lot of consequences. Right. So making a change to a material has to be done in a very structured and careful way. Okay, that's the main point, right? So now uh, you should follow material changes or carry out material changes through the whole process of engineering change management. And once again, we discussed two different approaches to change management right here. Okay, so advantages of engineering change management in general are one, of course, is you can group together changes that are related, right? So, and then make a mass change so that uh, uh, it's easy to see what are all the changes that took place rather than changes just being all kind of unrelated in some way. Uh, you can monitor and document the changes. Okay, so and again, it'll all be in one single place. Uh, you can save multiple change states for an object. Okay, so you can have versions and multiple change states. So you can say this change is effective on this date. This other change is effective on some other date. So you could have all of those uh, kinds of things. Uh, this is what this is. Planning and uh, setting of effective validities. And then you can integrate the whole thing into the logistics process change. So in general, making change through the change management system is preferable. Engineering change system is preferable. Okay, there are two alternative approaches through which you can do these change, do this whole aspect of engineering changes. One is called the change master record. Okay, and the other is a much more formal process. Remember, we spoke about in SAP in general, there is a formal process of request, order, and then execution, right? So this is the the, the second process is the one that is the more formal process. You go through a request and uh, it's released and ordered and so on. This is just you know, a single step kind of a change process. Okay, and the chapter is discussing both of those very briefly and talking about the relative merits and demerits. So that's what we'll be looking at. Okay, so this is a change master record approach where uh, you essentially in a change master record, what you do is you create a change master header which in which you indicate what is the reason for the change, uh, what is the validity, what is the status as we spoke about earlier. And then you indicate what are all the different types of objects that are involved in the change. That is, you're going to make a change to many different objects, right? So for example, here you see bomb, routing, and so on. So you say these are all the types of objects that are involved in the change. Here you indicate the specific objects which are involved, right? This bomb, this routing, this material, you indicate all of those objects, right? And then of course, the change master record can link to the accompanying documents and it can have a classification linkage to itself so that you can find loops for example you can search for specific changes that that were affected etc etc that you can do 
and then you've got the alternative dates because remember we said validity periods so it could do all of this okay so that's the change master uh, record approach to making a change <clears throat> okay so we spoke of uh, all of these things the other approach is called the engineering change request engineering change order ECR ECO approach okay oh um, yep so uh, when you do something like this it has to be reviewed by certain departments right so this one you, that you're specifying right now it's just that the one single person goes in he looks at what documents he wants to change and he'll do the change this one right yeah but what if there are multiple departments involved in if you want a more complex process this is the one on the right hand side okay on the right hand side that's that's exactly the reason for this See, sometimes you want to keep it simple, so you keep it that way. But like you're saying, if it's really complex and multiple departments are involved, you want a much more formal process of approval before you go and jump and make the change, right. then you go for this. Okay. So here you see, you first create an engineering change request. Okay. Okay. Just like a purchase requisition or a you know sales inquiry, you make an engineering change request and you pretty much supply the same sort of information that is there. Okay. What kind of objects? What actual objects, etc. Right then it's formally approved the change request is formally approved and then you create a change order engineering engineering change order the order then based on the order you actually go and then make changes to the various objects okay so then you have the approval process that you're talking about okay they seem to like this uh, in terms of from the exam point of view now they seem to like this engineering change request change object stuff. So just look at this particular slide carefully. Uh, you know, I saw at least two people last time they were taking the exam. I saw two people at least who had this question. Okay, so that's they were not the only two. They were the two I happened to be seeing at the time they were answering that question. Okay, so uh, just take a look at that. It doesn't look like something important, but I think this chapter has a lot of different topics. So even if they try to address you know, there are five different topics, right? Even if they try to address any three of them, you'll end up with three questions from this. Okay, so just take a close look at this chapter. Okay. Um, and status network enables request check, release, workflow, etc. I mean, workflow enabled because you've got the request. Once the request is approved, it becomes an order. Then, you know, you have the workflow for somebody else to go take the order and complete it and so on. <coughs> Okay, so that completes our discussion of this chapter on life cycle uh, data. Yeah. Okay. Can you pick up 30,000 foot level of this chapter? It's, it's just too many different things. Okay. Uh, so, in, yeah, I think this is what they were trying to do when they wanted to give us that 30,000. Right. So, these are totally unrelated things all just crammed into one chapter. That's what it looks to me like. Okay. <laughs> That's what it really looks to me like. Right. All of them have sort of some kind of relationship with product life cycle management. Very peripheral. I don't know. Classification system has nothing to do with it, really. It's just sitting out there. Yeah. In a life science, for example, medical device or pharmaceutical companies, this is pretty important because all the changes need to be in compliance with the regulation. This is important. So before like production or you know, supply selection and purchase order, this needs to happen for them to get the list of you know uh, orders to you know on, you know on their or items or materials on their uh, purchase order to start ordering stuff and processing because all the sequences in your operation need to be documented in one way or another. So this is I mean you know in other for example in uh, like food industry this might not be a big deal. They might not have PLM implemented. All of these steps? Yeah. Especially ECRs and ECLs or ECMs. They need to have that for every product, basically. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. See, the some parts of it, obviously, I mean, each one independently is very important, right? But I think your question was, what is it that connects all these together, right? Uh, one way to look at it is, uh, if you look at, for example, 
uh, the uh, you know the integration aspect of it right much of the integration aspect of it like connecting documents connecting to external systems right that all deals with the specification of the product right so all of that is connected to in some sense the product specification engineering and so on right and then if you look at the engineering workbench that is also connected with working with bill of materials and routings and looking at all of them in an integrated way so some of these things are about the definition of the product itself right and then like he pointed out change to that definition and tracking the change okay so at least three of the things are fairly well connected in that sense right and the variant configuration is also kind of related but you know not to life cycle aspect but an important point of how do you define a configurable product right and i think they included that in this chapter because it uses the classification system in general okay so not a very 30000 view it's more like a, a 100000 foot view but it's there okay so that completes our discussion of uh, life cycle